Welcome to Bloombox Growing Deeper. I'm Sarah. I'm Hannah. And we're on a mission to help you become the gardener you want to be. Happy Halloween, everybody. It's a spooky day. <laughs> it is. And we're going to talk about scary things. Scary, scary, scary bees. And murder <laughs> hornets. Murder. <laughs> <laughs> Hannah loves Halloween, if you can't tell. I do. I read a book recently where they wanted a grouping of dragons to be called a murder of dragons, like a murder of crows. Yes. In the book, they said that they found out that that's not true, and it's actually called a rave of dragons, Mm. which also sounds fun. I'd go to a dragon (laughs) rave. (laughs) With the dragons. <laughs> it's if they're friendly dragons. Always friendly. Okay, that's what I, I imagined. You were a friendly dragon person, and not a dragons as monsters person. Well, you know, Matthew did tell me all about the season finale. Spoiler alert of the latest Game of Thrones, like prequel, and uh, the dragons were not friendly. See, apparently. that's why I don't watch that. I'm only in it for friendly dragons. Me too. Okay, that's one of many reasons <laughs> I don't watch that. <laughs> Uh, Anyways, back to spooky. Yes. We're going to face our fears together today. That's right. Along with several other people. And we are so grateful for all the people who agreed to fear face with us. And (laughs) share their potentially embarrassing stories. Mm -hmm. It happens. So what fear are we talking about? Stings. Stings and bites. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. All those things that can sometimes keep people out of the garden just because they're afraid it might happen. But uh, the chances aren't honestly that high. No. Um, how many Have you been stung by bees or wasps? I have been stung a total of three times. Once by a wasp and twice by bees. One bee sting, it was in my, a soda, which I have learned from this experience that that's common. It seems to be the most common way people get right. stung. Another one, I was walking to the library with my niece and nephew, and I think that the bee just got stuck under my armpit uh, on accident. Yeah. It was flying. I was walking. It was the wrong place, wrong time situation. So I got stung. No, I was fine. The wasp one made me mad. <laughs> Because that was when I was a kid in my backyard, and it stung my lip, and it like <sighs> held on. I, like, yeah. It off. Well, they don't lose their stinger I like know. a bee does, so yeah. They just stick around. But it sounds like none of your stories were, I was gardening when no. I got stung. and that's a, So I've been stung twice in my life, both by wasps. And both times it happened because I stepped barefoot on the wasp. And one of the times the wasp was actually already dead. (laughs) So I stung myself on a dead wasp. Sure. (laughs) Um, It does sound like something you could do. It does. Me especially. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Just sounds like a problem I would get myself into. So we're going to hear other people's stories. I it's like one of the most common things that gets brought up. When I talk to school gardens and... Will you talk to the gardens? Uh, yes, I do talk to the gardens, <laughs> don't you, Hannah? Well, I do, but they don't usually talk back. <laughs> <laughs> well, depends on how bad of a day I've had. That's true. <laughs> how close to Halloween it is. Right. right. Um, oh my gosh, I should be a flower. <laughs> oh, have you not decided what you're going to be? Yeah, we're recording this three days early. No, I haven't decided. You decided like two months ago. I know, but I don't have any, like, I don't have a kid, so I'm not going to oh. go around trick-or-treating. I'm just going to have kids come to my house and hand out candy. That's, That's almost creepy. harder because you have to dress up in something they will recognize. Yeah, and come to work. Mm. Oh, I'm um, definitely dressing up for work. I know you are. I'm just going to wear my Hocus Pocus t-shirt, yeah. maybe my cat ears. And I'm thinking, last year, I was a cat burglar. Oh, it was fun. that's a great idea. I was idea. like a burglar, but then I put cat ears on. Maybe a cat burglar. Love it. Um, but I was sick. Oh. I had like some weird virus going on. It was terrible. It was not COVID. And oh, I remember was, that. You were really sick. It was terrible. So I was just like at home, like in my cat costume, <laughs> drinking hot tea. Like, so I didn't get to have a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, so year, maybe I'll try it again. Yeah. 
One year, so I actually made this a few years before. I have a very elaborate Princess Bride dress. It's her blue dress she wears when she's running around the castle yes. looking for her letter. Yes. If you know the movie. And it was wonderful. Uh, all the grown ups knew what I was. Mm-hmm. I wore it downtown to the bars. Everybody knew who I was. My husband was the Dread Pirate Roberts. Yeah. That helped. Uh-huh. And a few years later, I walked to answer the door and they all thought I was Elsa. And I was. Oh. A little insulted by that, but I got over it. I mean, there is worse things. There to are be worse called. things to be called than <laughs> Elsa, who was That's their right. favorite at the time. Did you just say that I'm going to let your candy go? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think I fought it the first couple times, and I was like, you know what? It's about making you happy anyway. Yeah. If, yeah. if Elsa makes you happy, sure, I'm Elsa. There you go. Have you ever been a bee? No, but you've been a flower. I've been a. F- have oh, I been a flower? But only for Spring Affair. Oh, which I was is a flower also for a Spring dress Affair. up occasion yes. if you didn't know. Yes. <laughs> I was a flower for Spring Affair. Um I was a butterfly for Spring Affair one year. Right. Mm-hmm. There's a I have monarch wings. They're in this office somewhere. We can't find them. In this room or in this building? <laughs> um maybe in this room, but definitely in this building. <laughs> Not the warehouse. Oh, that you know what? Somewhere on campus. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> they could also be in the back of the greenhouse. <laughs> well, if they're in the warehouse, um, a bunch of mice have made them home. <laughs> oh, probably. You so. know, they weren't that expensive. We bought them on Amazon before Spring Affair. Yeah. Uh, no, I have not dressed up as a bee. That will be something to keep in mind. Oh, my yeah. gosh. I keep hitting your laptop. Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> um. So if you dress up as a bee, so you have a family. So yes. family costumes, yes. I think. So let's put it together. Someone has to be a flower. Yeah. Someone has to be a bee. What's the third thing? Ooh, pollen. <laughs> that sounds like a really boring costume, doesn't it? Just, uh, <laughs> Just wear yellow. Lump of yellow. Uh, hmm. A bee, a flower. I mean, you could be a butterfly. You could be multiple flowers. You could be multiple flowers. Because we plant diverse food sources around That's here. Right. Mm-hmm. We could all be bees because yes. several bee species are social. Or together. Yeah. Would you have a stinger? Yes anatomically correct would you use it <laughs> mm. would it have venom in it and it would be like, probably I don't like you. not have venom but if you annoyed me i might sting you so that was one of my favorite things that i learned about the during this uh recording getting all of these stories pulled together i didn't realize that bee stingers had venom in them. i just thought yeah. it was a no. sting and it hurt that's why it hurts because just if i just poked you then it would that hurt, hurts. <laughs> but it wouldn't like swell up or anything. So they do have a venom. It's, Are you sure? Yes. <laughs> I know they, yes, I know we're I, sure they have a venom. Oh, but I like, so, I've pulled like a lot of needles I out of myself. Myself. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Let's me, okay, so, you know, my cat is. Yes crazy (laughs) but cats have irritants in their claws too right but what i was gonna say is so i give my cats my cat three injections a day (laughs) poor cat (laughs) he doesn't mind he purrs through it um and i have poked myself many a time with those needles some not so small and it swells but it's not just a needle there's something in it saline oh because it's fluid Hmm, interesting I pulled this one, a lot look of at that one. Oh it's a wow! Scar. I did that, that like is. two months ago. You got to be more careful. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, well, I sew a lot, and so I pull needles and pins out of my hands sometimes when I'm drinking wine and sewing. It's not a great combination, <laughs> and they don't swell. The hem gets a little crooked. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've stepped on them. It's, I'm not oh. proud of this, okay? I, I didn't mean to sound so flippant. <laughs> no. I don't like to poke myself with but needles. But it doesn't swell like a no. bee sting. But I don't swell super easily. Okay. And I know you have fair skin, so you yeah. might just swell more easily. I, I turn red easily, too. It happens. Than anything. But that's... So that venom is there to irritate us. Like, they really want to make sure... If a bee stings you, it stung you because it's scared you're going to hurt it or its family. Right. And it's going to die. It's going to (laughs) die. So it's putting a lot into this sting and it wants to make sure that you got the warning. That's true. So that venom is supposed to irritate. Deter you enough. Mm -hmm. Oh, here's another fun bee sting story. Has your dog or like a pet you've had ever been stung by a bee? No. My dog one time got stung by a bee. Right on the nose. He liked to chase them. Not Alistair. This is a dog I had as a kid. 
and he got stung right on the nose and his nose got so big remember those like <laughs> cards from the early 2000s that were so popular with oh. like the distorted dog faces yes, with really big noses yeah, yeah that's what he looked like oh that's funny a couple benadryl fixed it yeah see that's that's what we want to talk about today mm-hmm. is nobody likes to get poked or sung yeah. um but frankly it's a risk of life uh and we're gonna hear from a lot of these bee sting stories that so very few of them happened because i was gardening right i think only one of them is gonna be a because i was gardening story the other one is a the others are all like i was in the outdoors in some mm-hmm. capacity mm-hmm. and so we don't like to get stung but it's a risk of life if we want to be outside yeah. Um, frankly, we couldn't live without bees, so it's a risk worth taking. And w- at the end of the episode, we'll go over some of the actual statistics of how often a bee sting is more than just an ouch. Yeah. How mm-hmm. often is it actually something to worry about mm-hmm. um, and what to look for? Well, if um, there's no kids around, sometimes it's more than an ouch. <laughs> yes, but <laughs> I say yes, some other things. <laughs> You might say a few more words than ouch. <laughs> uh, but it's it's for none of these people telling the stories did it stop them from gardening or working with insects. No. Yeah. They all are still doing it. Yeah. Um, and I've honestly caused myself much more injury with using my tools incorrectly than <laughs> a bee has I ever was <laughs> lifting wrong using has been a problem yeah, lifting wrong has been a problem in this office yeah um trying to use a spade and flip-flops has been a problem okay don't call me out like that. <laughs> <laughs> uh using a spade with no shoes at all has been my problem yeah so not at work guys not at work no these are personal problems <laughs> mm-hmm. uh so You know, there's always the potential to get hurt and you have to weigh that against the benefit that you're going to get from having pollinators in your life and and a garden in your life. And Mm -hmm. um, also, I want to make it clear, please stop asking us for gardens that don't attract any bees. Oh, yeah. That's impossible. We'll give you plastic flowers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, or pollinator gardens that only attract butterflies. That is only a, the butterflies. A real frustration to me. Um, there's, I don't know those. We plants. could make it a pollinator garden where all the plants have butterfly in their name. We could, <laughs> but they all attract bees. Mm-hmm. Uh, butterfly milkweed has lots of bees. Oh visitors. my gosh, so many bees. So yeah, um, let's just go into our story. Should we hear some stories? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so one time I, uh, when I had a radio show in Montana, I was in a booth by myself doing a radio show and, um, it was summer. So like no one was around, all the students were gone. It was on campus. And, um, all of a sudden, like there is a a Hornet, I think I'm still not entirely sure flying around in the booth with me. And I'm just like, okay, I kind of paid attention to it, but like, you know, I was trying to ignore it pretty soon. Um, the little bugger crawls right underneath like the arch of my foot. I was wearing flip flops and just like stung me right underneath my foot. I was doing a radio show, so I couldn't leave. I didn't know what to do. I got on air and asked for advice and solutions from people. Um, someone mentioned, you know, uh, urinating on it, which is not correct. Um, and then I got another caller that told me that I should, uh, take some nicotine and, and soak it and put it on there. Um, so another listener heard that brought me a cigarette (laughs) and I ended up uh, opening it up and like, like kind of wadding the nicotine up and sticking it on my foot. I don't know if it really worked. It felt better. It made me feel better, but I was stuck in this booth by myself. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's my story. (laughs) (laughs) All right. This next story is from my beautiful niece, beautiful and smart niece. Stella Bella is what I call her. She is eight years old. And she's so excited to tell you her story about being stung by bees in my dad's backyard. I was in my grandpa's backyard, 
and he made like these cool um fake animal things and I was petting one but I didn't know that a whole um wasp's nest was on it and I was petting the wasp nest so they just started coming out and one of them stung me in the back of the ear This last story was submitted by email, so I will read it to you. It's from Emily, a lovely co-worker of ours, who has much garden experience and was most definitely not put off by this particular story. It has not stopped her gardening endeavors one bit. I'm not afraid of stinging insects. Unlike my irrational fear of spiders, they don't bother me at all. But one dark and stormy night... Oh, wait, it was a beautiful sunny afternoon. (laughs) I was going to be surprised. (laughs) (laughs) I was mowing the backyard and felt a terrible pain in my nether regions. Oh, no. Bad. I went inside to check it out. Clearly something had bit or stung me. Ouch. (laughs) I'm guessing she didn't just say ouch. (laughs) I went back out and kept mowing. Then it happened again. Back inside again. Oh, my gosh. And then back out to continue mowing. After the fourth time, I realized bum- a bumblebee. Four times? Four times. Come yeah. on, Emily. <laughs> <laughs> After the fourth time, I realized a bumblebee or bumblebees was pissed at me mm-hmm. mowing over its ground nest and kept flying up my loose shorts, getting confused and agitated and stinging me. It's like it was stuck inside my shorts, I swear. I pulled them off right there in the backyard. It was no fun and pretty darn painful, mm-hmm. but not so scary, I guess. Especially since she kept going back out. Oh, my gosh. Except for any passerby seeing a crazy lady in her underwear in her yard (laughs) flailing around. (laughs) Thank you, Emily. (laughs) That might give me pause if I was just walking the dog and I was like, what's happening back? What's going on in that yard? Keep (laughs) walking. We appreciate your willingness to share that story. Yeah. Um, And, yeah, I I think it's it's a great story to highlight the fact that this bee was angry at you, but it didn't sting you till it got confused. And you know what? When I'm confused, sometimes I stick people with needles, too. <laughs> <laughs> Mostly myself. All right. Up next, we did talk with two folks who work with bees a lot, Courtney and Aaron. And so we're going to go right into their stories and their messages for us. All right, so now we've got Courtney here, and Courtney works for the UNLB lab. So do you just want to remind us what your job with the bee lab is, and um, then how does that lead you to interacting with bees on enough of a basis to be familiar with what it means to get stung and how you deal with that? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, so uh, my name is Courtney Brummel, and like you mentioned, I work for the University of Nebraska-Lincoln Bee Lab. I am the project coordinator with the lab, so I do a lot of different things. And part of my job is outreach and education, helping with program development with the Great Plains Master Beekeeping Program, and um, some field research with native or like wild bees. And then a big portion of my job is working with honeybees and helping out with our research colonies and also utilizing them for different outreach and extension events. So especially in the summer, I'm in the honeybee colonies frequently. And so yes, I get stung quite a bit. I have been working with the bee lab since 2018. And in that span of time, I've honestly lost track of how many times I've gotten stung. It's got to be easily in, I mean, it's above 100. I know that much. So it's probably about, actually, I probably get stung 100 times a year, like on average. So kind of just depends. So <laughs> You say that like it's no big deal it's at really all. Not, you just, yeah. something you get used to yes. or is, I should ask you, is there, a, have you been stung by like native bees or do, would you Ooh. know? I'm wondering if there's a big difference between being stung by a honeybee and a native bee. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's a good we'll question. To find, I, there's obviously a difference with a bee and a wasp. Right. We all know that, but I will have to find somebody who knows. Right. That. It just seems very uncommon to get mm-hmm. stung by native bees. Um, it seems like people mostly know they got stung by a honeybee. Right. Yeah, I would say that it really depends. Like, you're, you have your solitary bees. They live alone. They, you know, lay their egg for reproduction. And they really, they have no 
fight in the game because they just want to, you know, lay their egg and live their happy life. It's your social insects, so your social bees, your social wasps. Those are the ones that people are getting stung by because they're more they have to be more aggressive to protect that large gathering of resources they have, whether that's between their their honey and also their brood, their babies. So, that's why you see a little bit more aggression with those you know, those social insects and um Definitely. So I have been stung by bumblebees before, which are a native species. And I will say, I think that it hurts more than honeybee stings. Again, I'd have to look into like the actual like chemical science behind that. I will say, I think part of that is because bumblebees can sting you multiple times. They do not have that barbed stinger. And so they'll just keep coming after you. So as opposed to the honeybee, which has the, the barbed stinger. I was just hypothesizing that since honeybees are more of a of livestock and we breed them, mm-hmm. that if there was any smart person out there in the breeding <laughs> world, they would be working very hard to make it hurt less. Right. <laughs> yeah. I don't think we're there yet because I don't know. You'd have to really manipulate like the venom sac and that that's beyond my <laughs> mental capacity. But there is breeding of honeybees for... Um, a more like a friendlier you know behavior so honeybees have these like subspecies or I like to relate it to like how there's dog breeds there's like breeds of honeybees so for example your Italian and Carniolian subspecies of honeybees they tend to be more friendly they're more focused on honey production because that's kind of the region that they're from right there's longer seasons and that has a big influence on the demeanor of our honeybees as opposed to um, like there's a Russian subspecies of honeybees and they tend to be more aggressive but they're also that way because they have to protect their resources in adaptation to that the very harsh winters and very short season so also um there's af like african bees or bees from further south that tend to be a little bit more aggressive and they are also because they have to protect their food because there's a lot more predators in those tropical areas so fortunately the sting still hurts <laughs> but I found that so kind of my like journey of being stung which was just part of the job I guess is so I started working at the UNLB lab and I had gotten stung like once by a honeybee as a child and it was actually quite traumatizing I do not at all take that away from people when they're like they're scared because I get it and then when you've been stung and you're just like what happened like why did this happen I got stung in the mouth actually because the honeybee was in my mom's like pepsi and because they were going for the sugar and I had no idea obviously took a swig of that had excruciating pain no I you know as a child you're just like what happened <laughs> spit the pepsi everywhere um and my mom proceeded to have to like remove the stinger so yes I get it I've been there <laughs> But I, I would like to say that as part of my testimony, you can come back from that. Um, and so when I started working at the bee lab, I had not worked bees officially uh, from a beekeeper like research standpoint. And so my first year was pretty scary, if I'm being completely honest. There was definitely times where um, the frame, you know, with honeybees on it, when you pick it up and you're expecting it, there's definitely times where I flung them <laughs> as I was getting stung. And there was lots of tears. And there's definitely a point where I was like, do I really want to do this? Like, I'm, am I crazy? Like, what's happening? But the thing that was cool is over time, uh, my body actually built an immunity. And this is very common. So I was building an immunity and the reaction to the sting was less and less because that was the other part that I was like, this is so not cool. I would get stung. So at the university here, we practice gloveless beekeeping. It's not because we're crazy. I mean, we're a little crazy, but it's actually so that we're more intentional with our movements, um, with handling the frames. And I can honestly, I can definitely attest to that. When I wear gloves, there's a lot more slamming of frames. And it's accidental, right? Your your dexterity is just lessened. And so we, we do gloveless beekeeping. Um, so we have more ex- exposure to <laughs> getting stung, obviously. And so, yeah, so I would get stung on my hand. And then I would experience that localized swelling. So, like, for three, four, five days, I would have what I call, like, Mickey Mouse hands. They'd be large and puffy and hot and itchy. And I'm just like, this is the worst. Like, I can't do anything with my hands. And um, 
So yeah, that was just kind of annoying more than anything. And, but over time I would get, you know, stung and then it would maybe swell for two days or one day or not at all. So there's definitely some, you know, phenomenal processes happening there with building that immune immunity and, um, it still hurts, but also is kind of part of this, this mentality of, okay, I'm going to be all right. It's gonna, you know, the, I, I know what to expect. And that's kind of something I tell people is like, okay, even if they do sting you, like barring you have obviously a severe allergic reaction, I want to kind of like put a little note in there. There's some folks that, and, and most of those individuals know who they are because they have an EpiPen, right? They know that, okay, if I get stung by a bee or a wasp, my body is going to go into anaphylactic shock. So I'm not going to be able to breathe. Essentially your body is like, attacking itself because it's um, not able to respond to that venom from the sting. So that's a legitimate issue and I don't want to take that away from anybody. But I'd say a majority of folks, they do have just that localized reaction. Your body's reacting to the venom from the sting and so you're going to experience obviously pain and then swelling and some heat and irritation. So, but you're going to be okay. And I also say like, think of the honeybee like they're dead now which most people are like well good they stung me that was their own fault and I'll tell you most of the time with beekeeping it is the beekeeper's fault we just have to you know watch what we're doing and stuff but yeah there's definitely sometimes where the bee is just like crusty and just like grumpy and you're like well you're dead now and that was kind of your own fault so <laughs> sorry <laughs> but yeah so it's it's definitely all very very interesting and um, there is, you had mentioned something about like wasp stings are different than bee stings. There is a slight pH difference. That's interesting. So, um, but it, I mean, it still hurts. So there's that, but so I'm not immune to like wasp stings just because I've been stung a lot by honeybees cause their pH is different. So my body is not yet immune to that. So something new to add to our, um, Halloween monster making a venom sack. That sounds <laughs> fun. <laughs> yes. Um, and since it is Halloween, right, people are going to be facing their fears mm, that's good. today, right? You're, you watch your scary movies and you do all that. So before we started recording, you told us about sting therapy. Yes. Which is, I guess, one way to face your fear. <laughs> <laughs> but what is that? Can you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, absolutely. So it's like a more like natural medicine practice. It's way more prevalent and originated over in Europe. And um, it has not been like officially adapted in the United States, so you can't like have a official practice of it, but you can certainly do it on your own. You just gotta grab a bee. So <laughs> I just <laughs> I love this. I just learned about it from um, a mentor in Michigan. His name is Adam, and he does work with um, bees and veterans. And it's honestly just like struck a note in my heart. I'm also in the military and I know people, and I mean, everyone knows someone that has gone through some sort of, you know, uh, stressful experience, whether that's physically or mentally, emotionally. And so he's doing just amazing work with his program where they're allowing people to like get close to bees and talk with them, right? Which is part of like verbally processing things going on or get into the beehive and just be able to take care of an organism similar to like a quine therapy or like, you know, your therapy dog. So there's just this beautiful partnership with working with nature. And um, another part of the program that they're doing that I learned about and now I'm practicing is this, is this sting therapy. So essentially, and I can't name all of the chemicals that are involved in a, a honeybee, you know, sting with the venom, but there is very beneficial chemicals in there similar to like cortisol shots, which you would have to go to the, you know, doctor to get anyway. And there's, uh, there's some really unique properties um, specific to the bees. But regardless, what happens is when you um, sting, so I specifically will sting like joints that I have aches and, um, you know, pain in. So like my knee, cause I've had a couple surgeries there, my shoulder, cause I have injuries from different things. So I've known a lot of people will do it for their hands for arthritis. And so 
essentially the process looks like this. So visualize you have, um, we will actually like catch the bees and put them in like a little box. You can also, I've done this where you just kind of pick one up and you can use tweezers too off of like a flower. Very, very challenging to like <laughs> grab obviously, <laughs> like the karate kid with the chopsticks <laughs> and the fly. So it's that's kind of complicated, which is why we put them in like a box. And then um, I will take like tweezers and then like pick up that bee out of the box or off of the flower. And then I will actually, and this is something they taught me, but like practice gratitude because now that bee, I'm thanking them for their life. Thank you for your medicine. And then I will essentially press the bee into my, you know, my joint, whatever that is until they sting, which it usually doesn't take very long because they're already like, what are you doing holding me? And, um, so then they will sting the stinger obviously gets stuck in there cause there's uh, a barb and so it gets caught in our skin. And then, you know, I remove the bee, the stinger and the venom sac remains on in my skin. And you sit there for like 10 minutes and actually let the ven venom sac pump all of the venom out into your joint. And during this process, so I'll be honest, when I first heard about this and we were going to this workshop, in Michigan with Adam, I was like, this is crazy. Like, why would I do this? I already get stung from my job. Like, this is painful. Like, why would, you know, how is this going to actually help? And I'm going to be completely honest. Like, it's com it's very different when you're sitting down, you're mindful, there's this sense of gratitude. And also, like, letting the venom sac pump out for, like, one bee versus when I'm working and you're, like, experiencing, like, a dozen bees a day. That's, that's not on the healthy side. You only do the sting therapy with, like, one or two bees at a time. Um, cause it's very powerful. It's very potent. And as I was sitting there with that first sting in my knee, I honestly felt like my mind just kind of being bathed in like, I don't know, like dopamine and, and just like happy things. Right. I just felt like, and I really could experience the pain in my joints, um, going away. And that lasted for like three days to a week. It was phenomenal. So, and that's been other people's testimonies too about this. So I just think it's fantastic that, um, it goes back to like nature is our medicine and honeybees, you know, their sacrifices allows for us to experience like that relief of pain without having to, you know, from my, my friends that I've heard from without having to just get like medicine, you know, pills that leaves them just like numb to their life and their world. Like this is something that allows them to keep functioning and actually like have that pain relief, but still like have mental clarity, you know? So it's, it's amazing. I mean, it is different to to get a surprise bee sting and, like you said, a lot of them at a time or to, like, purposefully, yes. I mean, it's like getting a shot. Like, you're already in pain. Right. And it's not like <laughs> you are doing this because you're already having a good day. You're having pain. Yes. <laughs> so I can see a big difference there. That's very true. But thank you, Courtney. Yeah. Um, we have other people to hear from about bee stings on our fun Halloween episode. Um, but thanks for sharing. Yeah, thank you. So we're here with Erin Ingram, and she is going to talk to us about her experience with all different types of insects, but uh, we will focus a little bit on stings. So why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks, Hannah. Uh, I'm Erin Ingram. Um, I'm he I've been invited in today because uh, I have a background in entomology, so I got my master's in honeybee toxicology. It just means that I studied how pesticides uh, impact bees. Uh, specifically, I worked with honeybees, but in that training, you get all kinds of other awesome information and understanding about insects more broadly. So um, I work now as the community engagement coordinator for UNL's uh, Institute of Ag and Natural Resources Science Literacy Initiative, which is known as Growable. You can find us online at growable.unl.edu. Very cool. And I know a word that I hear you use a lot is science literacy. So how does that play into your career right now? Yes. So um, I have both training as an elementary educator and as a research scientist. And so now I get to kind of squish those two together. So I work in teaching, you know, K-12 teachers. I work in the K-12 space. Um, around dealing with messy systems and complicated problems. So we love to use school garden spaces as a place to engage students in like these awesome systems where there are lots of feedback loops and interactions. Um, but also it's just this messy place where um, students get to really see those systems in action and have some control over, you know, the space in the garden. 
messy spaces sounds perfect for us. Yes. Uh, I know that was um, one of the ways that we interacted. We kind of ran into each other through that school yes. garden uh, work. And I know something... Some One of the reasons we thought about this episode is because I hear about stinging insects from schools a lot. Sure. There's a lot of fear about, um, I think, adults have memories of the first time they got stung. Uh, they have a fear of kids experiencing the same thing. And then they have a fear of talking to that poor kid's parent when they have to call and say, I got your kid stung by a bee. <laughs> um, so we're going to talk a little bit with Aaron. It is Halloween, so we're going to talk about stinging insects and what happens when you get stung but we're also just going to talk about what happens in that system and how we have to have insects in that system and how we can prepare ourselves to enter it and be part of it rather than an aggressor that you know comes in and stirs the whole thing up and makes our our insect friends mad at us so as we were talking about you know where what direction we'd go in our conversation we talked about aggressive behavior versus defensive behavior can you tell us a little bit about um, the difference between those two and maybe what causes them or how we can recognize them in insects and use that to either protect ourselves or, you know, you know, stay part of the system and, and observe it when we know things are just being defensive? Yes. So first thing that you mentioned is that insects are just so essential in a garden. You are not going to have... Um, you know, these beautiful flowers that we like so much that smell so good. Well, they're nice smelling to us, but they're really nice smelling to insects as well. And so you're not going to have, you know, these things without insects around. Um, And that's just a reality. But I think it's also just beautiful that it is this gorgeous system at work, right? You have, um, you know, these flowers that are functioning as a buffet for all of these insects. So you're providing wonderful food for insects that are desperately in need of it, right? We're, we're providing important habitat and part of that is food. Um, but also if you want your plants to produce fully formed, fully sweet, you know, fruit and vegetables, it's going to require adequate pollination. And the only way that that happens in those types of, you know, in cucurbits, you know, things like melons, things like squash, pumpkins, all the things your kiddos love to see, you know, and watch develop in the garden space. The only way that that happens is with insect pollination. It's got a sticky pollen. It doesn't get wind pollinated. It requires an insect to move that stuff around. And that's true of a lot of different fruits and vegetable plants. Uh, unlike corn, you know, how that has that really, you know, you can see the pollen like drifting on the wind, right? It's not like that in your school garden most of the time where a lot of those plants are requiring insects. So I think as a as an educator um, and also an educator who's trying to like be as prepared as you can be, which is totally like the responsible teacherly thing to do, it's just to become you know, equipped with the knowledge of what's going to be there, how can I protect my kids, and how can we teach about things like systems in these spaces responsibly. And so you were mentioning things around defensive versus aggressive. Um, This is something that I hear a lot from folks who don't have a lot of experience with insects. And it's understandable that, you know, you hear these horror stories being that it's the the Halloween episode, right? The horror stories of like being stung. And it is, it's this psychological. Like the giant killer wasp that invaded a couple of years ago. I mean, how can you not have those feelings when you hear murder hornet, right? Like, (laughs) I, I totally get it. Um, But I think what's happening there is a fundamental misunderstanding of um, the fact that especially, okay, so you have bees. Let's talk bees just for a moment. That you have, you know, 4,000 different species of bees in North America. Of those, a very, very, very small amount are like the honeybee. That's one species, right? It happens to be like potentially having like aggressive genes and they have a whole colony to defend and they have lots of workers that if you lose one worker it doesn't like cause the crash of your colony so they are probably more likely um to be a you know aggressive stinger rather than the other 95 percent plus of those bees out there that are solitary think about it as like the single mom like she's responsible for equipping the nest, setting up the nest, gathering all the food, laying the eggs for her, you know, for her offspring. And she has a lot to lose 
if she stings something and gets swat and gets killed, right? So bees are not prone to sting. They're, they are only acting in a defensive way if something about them is being threatened. So if they're out foraging on a plant and you try to catch one in your hand, yes, you may get stung because you've provoked that insect and it's going to be defensive to try to, you know, survive. Um, same thing. I, and I was just sharing with, um, both Sarah and Hannah that I got stung a couple weeks ago by yellow jackets. They would have totally left me alone. I shook the plant that they had a nest in, right? I was threatening their home. They became defensive. And in fact, as soon as I moved out of the space, I moved away from them, the activity, you know, came drastically down and they were no longer a threat to me. And so I went out and, you know, gardened nearby without any problem. So I think the key is they are not, you know, these bees are not being aggressive. They are not coming for you. It is they're going to sting if they feel threatened. Um, and that could be them individually or around their nest. I think that um, as I heard you talk about that, one thing I, I would like to practice more is teaching people to observe what a bee home looks like because we have a story coming in from um, a colleague that we'll read later but you can be going completely about your business thinking that you are not being aggressive in any way and you may be tearing up their home that they've worked so hard for and it's only you know, logical that they'll be a little bit aggressive or defensive, as you pointed out, yes. in return, um, as would I if you came around and shook my house up. Yes. And, and that's a really great way to explain it to kids, too, is that we are going to be respectful, that we are coming into an insect's habitat, into their home. So we need to re be respectful of their space. And so can you observe insects, you know, especially bees like on flowers? Absolutely. Foraging bees are very unlikely to sting. They are so um, sort of of a singular mindset when they're doing that. They want to get food for themselves and for their families. Think about that. If you were in the grocery store and something came and snatched you up. So I think there are really great ways to have these conversations um, with the kiddos uh, in your classes to not only, um, you know, encourage respectful, you know, ethical behavior in school garden spaces, but also so that they understand sort of what's, what the purpose is of a garden space and why an insect is in it. I think the other challenging time can be ground nesting insects, because I know I've heard a lot of stories of, I just saw a hole and I put a stick in it. I, you know, every kid that's a natural thing to be like, there's a hole, there's a stick, let's see what happens. Yes, and unfortunately, yes. they learn what happens. Yes. <laughs> yes, I think that is very, very true that we have these sort of um, curiosities about us that like, really, we want to know what will happen. And you do find out what will happen, <laughs> you know, if it's a snake's you know, like den, that's one thing. But in many cases, I, I think people also don't understand how many bees are ground nesting. Mm -hmm. So of the solitary bees, 70% are ground nesters, another 30% are twig nesters. So those might be found in like old dead stems, like sticky stems. And so, um, yes, if you're going to go stick a uh, stick down these holes, I guess you may find out what lives there. So, and you may not like it. So um, those are things to be aware of. I think the other thing that as a teacher, and this is just like coming to mind, is that I know um, I've been to a couple school gardens that have a digging space to allow students. It's literally nothing's planted there. It's like kind of like a sandbox um, with soil in it. And there are, you know, cups and things for students to dig holes in because that is a very natural thing for kiddos to want to do. But this allows sort of a space to do it. But realize when you have that, it's also this disturbed soil that may end up with bees, you know, tunneling down and having a home there. So just be aware of those things. Um, and I think the more awareness that we have, we can we can take actions to be safe.
So how would you go about having that conversation with a teacher who I, I was very surprised, maybe unprepared is a better word for the request that I help schools plant gardens that attract butterflies, but not bees, because we can't have anything that might potentially sting. Um, and I know I've handled that conversation just by, you know, defining the system that we can't separate those two necessarily, um, that I have no way to guarantee that. And honestly, you wouldn't want that since most of the time our efficient pollinators are actually the bees. Um, is there anything else that you found really helps that conversation and, and, or that you found is actually on that teacher's mind more than just, you know, they might be afraid to get a student stung, but they may also not know how to have the conversation with the parents to explain what they're going to be doing. Yeah. So as you mentioned, it's a system. Um, you don't want to exclude bees from the system because without them, you have a non-functioning system, right? You have a broken system. And so, um, but there is a reason why when they label these pollinator gardens, when they either say pollinator garden or they say butterfly garden, and it's because of that perception in the public. And so I understand why it's done, but I also think it leads to an unreal expectation that you're going to have just butterflies in the butterfly garden. If it says butterfly garden, it's butterflies, bees, beetles, flies. So my first thing is that not everything you see is a bee. Not everything has a stinger. So uh, only female bees or wasps are going to be capable of stinging. It's a modified ovipositor. It's what they would use to lay an egg that has become a a means of defense for them, right? So again, we're using defensive, not aggressive. And so they do have it in case of the need to use it. But again, most of these bees are not wanting to sting you. They don't want to have to get into any kind of of a, a tussle, right? They, d they don't want that because it's a threat to their own survival. So I think that's what I would tell um, teachers and pass that that note, I guess, along to parents that like, it's unlikely to be stung. But I think key to all of this is you if you do have a parent that is, um, you know, worried about it, great. Does your child have any allergies? Let's keep that on file. Does your child need to have an EpiPen with them? Great. Let's ha make sure that's at the ready. I think the more that you can show parents that you are prepared, that you are, you know, becoming knowledgeable about what's in the space. I think if you can show that you know your stuff in a garden space, it does it goes a long way to sort of easing those again, we're talking about fear. We're talking about fear that in many cases is a perceived thing and not something that's actually something that you really need to be as worried about. I am personally m way more concerned about heat stroke or heat exhaustion in a garden space than I am about being stung. I'm way more concerned about that. And you can do a lot to take care of that in the garden space. Especially when one of those same teachers that uh, I had to talk down about stinging insects then brought all of her first graders out on a 98 degree day with no sunscreen. Yes, exactly. So we had to have a conversation about that. <laughs> yes, so I think what is... An important thing to talk about is like, you know, there are lots of things that you could be fearful of. You're doing your best to, you know, anticipate what will be a problem and what won't be. Going out with water bottles is another thing that I'm like, usually there's not access to like a space for students to get a drink of water. And if they go out on these really hot days, that to me is a much greater threat than the threat of a stinging insect. But, um, you know, it's sexier, right? The, the stinging insect has a like, a a whole myth, a whole lore associated with it, whereas heat exhaustion just doesn't, right? <laughs> so I think thinking about, you know, how do I make sure in all areas that I'm making this a safe space, insects and stinging insects being one tiny space of that, that I think is probably overblown in many cases. Can we get Halloween-y for a moment? Yes, let's do it. <laughs> okay, so I like that you talk about most bees or stinging insects don't want to sting you, right? Because it's 
it's very it's a hard time for them (laughs) and i talk about that a lot with with snakes as well like most snakes don't want to bite you because they would much rather hide they're going to give you a good warning if they are going to bite you um so as long as you pay attention you're going to be fine but there are some snakes that will chase after you and bite you (laughs) it's not going to be fun like black mamba you're going to die right so (laughs) are there any are there any stinging insects maybe that you're not going to die from but that are going to like chase you down and could we make a horror film about them (laughs) <laughs> so okay speaking of horror films one thing that is of note is a lot of these films where you see bees um or what are supposed to be bees right or like they're supposed to be wasps or whatever they're actually using like um a, a, an artificially created swarm of honeybees which is like the least defensive like setup <laughs> so like acted the actors are actually like doing a really great job considering that these bees are like going about their business like i have no home to defend I have no food to defend I I don't even really in some cases like have a queen that I'm super defensive of like defending so like they have set up those circumstances to look really scary but they aren't really scary right that's why you see people that could wear the bee beards Mm -hmm. again um so I think to go into this a little bit is that um behaviorally what can seem really aggressive to us is just bees going about their business being bees, right? And so uh, there are pheromones at play, um, both in social wasps and in social um, honeybees, that are why you might get chased by a lot of them. They are not, you know, giving, like looking at you and going, okay, I'm going to chase you down. They are triggered by an alarm pheromone that one will give off. And as soon as that's in the air um, and it's, you know, something that they can pick up, they can smell, they can sense that way. um, That is what's triggering group behavior where you get, you know, I had multiple yellow jackets kind of not chasing me, but like on me, um, definitely trying to move me away from the nest a couple weeks ago, right? So that is a, a response to pheromones. So they cannot react any other way. It is innate in them that like when this this alarm pheromone is smelled by others in the colony, they will turn on their defenses and they know that stinging is more likely. So if that happens where, and I knew it immediately when I you know dug up this bush that like, oh, I have disturbed their home. I walked calmly away from the space. I didn't swat at them. I did get stung once, but I didn't get stung repeatedly. And I think some of that is due to my reaction to knowing I was in a fearful like uh, situation, right? This is not good. I cannot stay here. I need to move out of the, the area. And luckily, one one sting later, I definitely learned my lesson to leave that space alone for a little bit. Um, so I think knowing a little bit more about how they operate, wasps this time of year um, are more likely to sting. So wasps in the fall, especially yellow jackets. Um, I know people who have a soda out at a picnic or something. You know, weather's great for us, also great for them. Um, they sometimes are, you know, you can get a sting in the mouth. Um, because they have gone to your soda looking for food and you don't know that they're there, right? So that's where you hear about a sting in the mouth and you're like, oh, that's that's not ideal. Um, But I think knowing that you've got bees definitely don't want to don't want to sting. But neither do really wasps, but they are going to be, I think, more easily to be Uh, defensive especially in the fall months fear is such an interesting thing too because the way you describe it i mean fear is really what's driving those insects to you know gather to release that pheromone to protect their nests they're afraid of what you could do to them yes at the same time that most humans are panicking in fear of what they could do to us so i Sometimes if you just prepare yourself for what fear means, then you can remember to stay calm. Remember that they are afraid too. And that, you know, the same as you would do, you know, if you approached a dog that turned out to be afraid of you, you would back away. And you can do the same for the insects and back away and let their fear calm down. And I, what I see a lot of adults do is passing their own fear that may have 
come from adulthood, but may have come from childhood and be remembered maybe not completely clearly, they're passing that same fear on to kids who are more innately curious. And, you know, you can remind them of some safety steps, but we don't need to make kids afraid. Yep. Um, and so many of those horror stories, like the bee in your in your drink at a picnic is completely accidental and it really sucks like <laughs> nobody wants to get stung in the mouth but it doesn't make bees aggressive and scary right it right. was an accident on every part <laughs> <laughs> right and i think thinking about that that like what is a sting again i got stung in the armpit not great um kind of bummed me out a little bit that that time on saturday but um, it wasn't terrible. It was a very brief, it was actually a lot less painful than I think I could have let my mind kind of, you know, snowball into thinking it was really painful when it really wasn't. Um, and I think this happens even before a sting happens where um, I see teachers or, or, you know, just adults in general um, that maybe even are speaking from a place of trauma where like they have been stung. And so then they're trying to pass on that fear of like, don't, don't, look at anything don't stay far far away from the flowers with the bees on them when in reality those bees that are foraging are unlikely to sting and it's actually like probably one of the easiest place to go and observe all kinds of insects is when they're feeding right because they're busy eating and they're not worried about you so if a sting happens i think you're absolutely right that we can make that a a as not traumatic as possible or we have the power to make it a super fearful uh, experience and that is largely based on how we are sort of setting up the situation um telling students that they need to be afraid of insects not not a great thing you know um letting them know the reality that insects will be there but that they are unlikely to sting da, 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 you know giving them good information i think is really key to having positive experiences in garden spaces rather than i'm going to the garden it has insects i'm terrified I have also been stung in the armpit, so I feel your pain. <laughs> <laughs> kind of literally, right? <laughs> no one ever wants to hear my sting stories because I'm like the least sympathetic about the only time I've been stung is when I stepped on dead wasps, mm. which, you know, isn't fun because it's on my foot, but also I don't have these great. I've been chased through the garden by a <laughs> nest of yellow jacket stories. So everybody's like, well, stop talking to me about being stung then. Um, but I think some of the reason is because most of my time in gardens is very observatory. I yes. am curious about everything that I'm seeing. And so I see the nest a lot of times before I've dug it up. And that's how I prefer to work with kids is that direction of curiosity and respect instead of you could lead this whole class of kids out to a garden in a state of fear that um, if they don't stay in line right behind their teacher and don't touch anything they're all going to get terrible bee stings and to me that's the such an unfun way to lead and um, I don't want a class of kids around me that I've just instilled this terrible fear and I want them to be curious and when they're curious, they see things before the problem happens. And we do have to also add the respect part in there that even if we see the bee nest first, we can't stick a stick in it. Um, but it, think about that before you start telling horror stories to your students that um, you can choose to lead them out to the garden um, excited to observe and respect the insects or you can take them out ready to fear everything in it. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's a really good point and I really don't even have a whole lot to add just that like that's a really great um thing to be thoughtful of um we kind of determine how far we let our own fears like in influence other students especially when you're in a classroom where you might have 25 or 30 students that you're there you have a lot of sway right and so to be really thoughtful about this is a chance to teach respect and how to, you know, like you said, wonder and curiosity, right? This, um, to notice and wonder, what do you notice? What do you wonder? Why might there be a hole right there? Mm, it might be 
the entrance to a nest, maybe we don't want to stick a stick down in there, right? You can build off of their curiosity to teach that respectful behavior. Thank you so much for coming today. We really appreciate it and for sharing all of your knowledge and your unfortunate stinging story. <laughs> We're sorry <laughs> about that as well. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm so glad I got to be here for the Halloween yeah, episode. Yeah. Okay, to wrap up our episode, we would love someday to talk to a medical professional um, and get their take on these things. So if any of you have a connection, hook us up. But like an allergist yes. is what we prefer. We but would I love guess an we allergist. won't get picky. We won't get picky because it's not like we had our own options ready to go. Uh, but in the meantime, Hannah did some research and All pulled right, up guys. some numbers for mm-hmm. us. All right, guys. So I'm about to graduate with a uh, master's degree. So they have told me I'm good at research because I already finished my research project and got a pass. By the way, you can only get pass or fail <laughs> <That's> <laughs> on that best project. That's kind of class. <laughs> <laughs> well, until you fail and you oh. can't graduate. <sighs> Hopefully the oh my god that just brought back that's my calm down calm down that's my Halloween fear. <laughs> Good gracious! So I did research about bees from reputable sources and okay. mostly bee stings. I'm being okay. in a master's program. She can identify a reputable <laughs> source. That's what they say. Okay, so first and foremost, all about bee stings. So number one. Everyone has a reaction to bee stings. Because of the venom. Because of the venom. So that's important to know. Just because you have a reaction doesn't mean that you're allergic. It just means that the venom did what it was supposed to do. And you are, in fact, a human. And you're a human. We're glad to know that. (laughs) Um, So what you need to do right away is try to get the stinger out. Because... With, if it's a bee sting, the stinger comes off and it has all the venom in it. And the faster you can pull the stinger out, the less venom you'll get injected with. So especially if you get stung and then the bee falls away, then you should immediately look at it. And if you can pull the stinger out with your fingers, just do that or find some tweezers. OK, and it's going to get red and it's going to get swollen. Be OK. Don't worry. It doesn't <laughs> at this moment mean you're allergic. Get some ice. Right. Get some ice. That's the number one recommendation from all the doctors online (laughs) is to put an ice pack on it, some kind of ice pack. Now, this is all if you know you're not allergic, right? So, Or you're you're evaluating to see if you need to find out if you're allergic. Right, right. Okay. So most people, that's going to be just fine and you're going to be okay. Here's some things to look out for. So if you've never been stung before and you get stung and you have more of a reaction than that, swelling, red, itchy, dry, other allergies that can come up, you might get hives, your blood pressure could drop, and you might have difficulty breathing and stomach pain or nausea, vomiting. If any of those happen, that's how you know you need to seek medical help right away. These can happen, especially you want to keep an eye out if you get stung the first time and you're fine, the second time it gets a little bit worse, the third time it gets even more bad. That's how you know you're developing an allergy if you weren't born with it. And as we learned, very few people are just born with it and will show an allergic reaction on their first sting. Most people will have to develop it over time. Right. Only about 1% of bee stings result in anaphylactic shock. And it's more likely to happen in people over the age of 25. So the only time you really need to worry about your children getting stung is if you or your pa- the parents have a bee sting allergy. Because then the kids, it, it is genetic. So kids are more likely to have it. So if that's the case, if you have a severe allergy to bee stings and you have children... Then just like if you had another allergy, you should probably work with your pediatrician to get them tested, which you can do. There's a few different tests you can do for bee sting allergies. And then the uh, doctor will be able to tell you and then you can make sure you have everything squared away um, so that if they do get stung. I mean, it's not going to be a fun day, but right. <laughs> they hopefully will be OK in the long term. Otherwise, you know, you just... You're going to have to give some cuddles and some ice packs 
and everything's going to be okay. And then you just got to get back out there, right? Get back on that horse. (laughs) And remember that a lot of times kids' perception of injuries is really based on ours. So Mm -hmm. if we panic and start screaming about bees, we leave them with that memory that bees things are a traumatic event. We can have a very huge effect on how they see things. So if there's no allergy, we just got stung by a bee, we're going to put some ice on it and it's going to be okay. We'll cuddle, maybe watch a movie. We're going to be fine. Right. They also did say if it does get dry and itchy, you can put some hydrocortisone cream on it and that can help. So those are, those are the first couple of things. Now, some stats about bee sting allergies and ultimately bee sting deaths. So the CDC just came out with their latest stats, which only go through 2017 because okay. they, they do like it takes time weird 20 year. I don't know. So it came out in 2017 and between 2000 and 2017, there were a total of 1,109 deaths from hornets, wasps and bee stings. So that's an annual average of 62 deaths. That's very In like little. the whole U.S. In the whole U.S. That's very little. That's mm-hmm. like so mm-hmm. little. Yeah. Not to diminish those people who passed. And we do feel sad about that. But it's not so likely. I think we hear about bee stings so much. I don't I think it's a horror film thing. <laughs> I don't know. I... And... Who, nobody wants to get stung, right? No. When you're not expecting it. So it does surprise you. However, I don't. it's not as prevalent as you think. And most, I mean, even these sources that you found, Hannah, say the uh-huh. most likely times that you will get stung is if you, um, you are out, you know, eating a picnic or sweet food and you trap that insect in your food and you take a bite or... Um, if you're out in fields and where you may not be able to like see your whole surroundings and you have a chance of trapping an insect in your clothes or stepping on them Mm -hmm. or in soda cans like we talked about that's a big one for sure so keep it you know they have those like things on um pinterest those like use a um what are those called that go like muffin tin things the oh the liners yeah muffin liners yeah is I that guess? what they're called i don't know <laughs> that's what i call cupcake them cups? cupcake like, cups yeah like those things you can put it over your like can of soda or something and poke a straw through it mm-hmm. and that's a great way to keep bees that's a and fantastic wasps way out. and plus bees aren't the only thing that gets in your drink i mean Ooh, little fishing right? out all those little gnats out of Ooh. your drink on a picnic is nasty so yeah uh, keep your drinks covered. Mm-hmm. Um, just, you know, be aware and and don't go looking for that problem. Don't stick a hole in a stick. You know, don't, don't stick, stick a, a stick, stick in, in a, a hole. hole. Don't go swatting at the wasp nest on your garage roof. You know, all all of the the things that wouldn't surprise you, unless you're asking for yeah. it. Mm-hmm. So those are the main things that I learned from my research. Um, I'm not going to lie. I did the research in about half an hour. <laughs> but you found but great sources. I, I, I mean, you're feel talking like I did. Uh, oh, the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report. That sounds like some light evening reading. Uh-huh. Who, uh, who doesn't read that? I, me? <laughs> <laughs> I guess I have now. <laughs> um, for my class this semester, I have had to read multiple Supreme Court cases. Let me tell you that. Oh, that <laughs> sounds not the best. terribly exciting. This one's so often they are. The Allergy Advocacy Association. Yeah. And uh-huh. the CDC. So I got to say, I did find one source that I thought was a little skewed, so I threw it out. Well, that's what you're supposed to do. That's Evaluate right. your sources. Mm-hmm. But uh, these other ones is from the Children's Hospital. So Boston Children's Hospital talked all about what to do with kids. I think another key thing is to make sure you wear light colored clothing, Mm -hmm. you know, not floral prints. (laughs) Avoid fragrances as best as you can before you go outside. Don't spray on that milkweed perfume. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, we should sell that. Okay. And then um, make sure you're wearing shoes. 
Yeah, I'll I'll remember that. Thanks. <laughs> Keep the <laughs> shoes on. So, and then there is conflicting evidence on this one. I have heard from my sources, <laughs> my online sources. Some say run away, and some say be calm and move away. I think looking back to some of our interviews from our professionals in the insect world, that bees and wasps get aggressive to move you away from their nests. Right. But you don't want to come across as aggressive yourself. So Mm -hmm. stay calm, but move away. Yes. Would be, I think that's where they got confused on some of that information. You want to move away from the nest. You don't want to run and flail and make yourself seem scary, but you do want to move yourself away from the nest. Unless a murder of ravens is attacking you. I (laughs) guess. (laughs) <laughs> then I'm going to run and Then flail. I'm going to run and there's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Okay. So I think that's bees. That's I think bee that's stings. bees things. Wasp things. Uh, I got to do the disclaimer because I'm in charge of legal here. None of this is medical advice. So talk to your doctor. Do all those things. But I don't think you need to be so scared. We can't help you with ghosts. Sorry. We cannot. Um, but you could. You know who you could call. Ghostbusters. <laughs> <laughs> Who are you going to call? Ghostbusters. We'll leave you alone now. <laughs> Happy Halloween. Happy Halloween, everybody. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Please rate and review us. That makes a big difference. Send us your questions. Sorry, we're probably not going to take any more stinging stories because this episode's done. We'll take them, but you, we might not air them. That's right. We would like to listen. The funnier, the better. It gives us a good day. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for listening. This has been Bloombox and Bloombox Growing Deeper are both programs of the Nebraska Statewide Arboretum. 